Adrian Mills with a slightly dodgy accent. But happy <laughs> birthday, Esther. Yes, Thank many, you. many happy returns. And to those of you who are celebrating and speak uh, one of these languages here, we know a global pop star who can sing you. Happy it? birthday. Don't, should, we start, should we start him now? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Off you go, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mika. Do you want right, to do it? Okay, well, actually, you can help me with that one. Fred, okay, fine. So, oh, French. Is, yeah. No, 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 come on. Very good, very good. Can you uh -huh. go to the Okay, story? badly, Queen Chiani Quayla. Oh, very good. Perfect. Sana Helwe Yagami. Oh, this is good. Yeah. Um, mm. Cumpleaños feliz. <laughs> this is good. Um, ah, Tanti auguri date. A te. There, wait, what about that? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you said you could do it, you did disappoint. <laughs> Church of the Italian X Factor and the French voice is the multi talented and multilingual. It's me, yeah, everybody. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Thank you. Wonderful to love you. That is, is quite a thing that you can speak so many languages. I can, no, but I can't speak Arabic and Chinese. I just know three words. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. This I, is I the speak that. Yeah, yeah I tell us about this one then. Why did you pick up Italian? Well, I got asked to do. Um, I was doing promo in Italy and I was singing a lot on X Factor there because, you know, obviously when you're releasing a record, you go around, you promote it and do yeah. TV shows. Uh, and then one day I was walking off stage and, and the producer runs up to me and she goes, would you do it? I said, what? She goes, would you judge? I said, what, here, in Italian? I, I thought it was a joke and I was laughing. And then <laughs> she said, no, I'm really serious. In the end, I kind of let it go and then they kept on calling me and I, I said, yes. I said, yes, because I was like, you know what? I've always said no to doing television. Um, but maybe if I do it somewhere like in Italy, like, I could just do it and really stay myself without having to change. And so it just left the last challenge. I signed the contract. My management thought that I spoke conversational Italian, but I didn't speak any Italian. Brilliant. And I had to learn Italian. Hmm? I had to learn Italian. I had two months to learn Italian before we did the and auditions. You did it? it was so terrifying. I can't tell That's you. That's remarkable. I felt like a teenager though. all over mm, again. My mm. brain. I had parts of my brain that were hurting in a way that they haven't hurt since my GCSEs. Sometimes it's good though to get back to that level, isn't it? And to have that intensity again in your life because you remember. Never what's again. No? Are you not? <laughs> I never want to do it again. But the thing is, I did. I did feel mm. like I had, like you know, climbed yeah. a little mountain. Um, and it's and I've uh, that was about a year and a bit ago, and my Italian's gotten a lot better. Right. But then I did the voice in France and all so. sorts. And in the middle, you've come out with a brand new album. Yes. Uh, before we talk about that, let's get in the Mika mood. Here we go. Mika, so you, you've got this new album then, No Place in Heaven, yeah. right? The whole studio was set up for you. Apparently they got you this absolute beautiful uh, place, uh, but yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, Conway in Los Angeles. No, I freaked out. There was, there was a lot of famous people there, and they're not necessarily... Like who? Uh, hang on, like who? <laughs> well, like Pharrell Williams was mixing in, oh, in the mixing famous, room. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. quite... We, yeah, he'll quite do. Big. Right. And then there was Max Martin, the famous kind of uh, singer-songwriter, who mm -hmm. was there, and loads of people were coming in. And I was there trying to write an album, and I'm looking around, I'm like, what am I doing here? This is not the kind of it's place. That I need to it was too much. Um, it was very nice, but it was too much, put too much pressure. So I basically had rented a house online and I said, you know what, I'm gonna write this thing at the house. And I called some of my, the musicians from my band, my MD, and we went there and we bought a Mac and we rented a piano and we stayed there. Without knowing it, I had rented this house, which um, was very nice. Not that flash, but it was actually Orlando Bloom's house. No really. Way. And, <laughs> and then you were like, this house is too much, I can't they, do this. No, well, no <laughs> and then I freaked out and ended up somewhere else. No, but they, they were quite picky about what, like, letting me rent it for a short space of time. But in the end, the, it was brilliant, because it was really, it's a nice bungalow from the 50s. But the problem was, we were recording in the living room, and every single hour and a half, or every hour, we had to stop because there'd be Star Tour buses that would be parked <laughs> oh, up outside. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> star. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And we're sitting there waiting. I'm in the middle of singing, we're just waiting. The first time it was really funny. After, after about three days, mm. it, it, it got yeah. less funny. Was his house tidy? The house was immaculate, right, really good. clean. I thought it would be. I thought that And really Orlando. woody. Just lots of wood everywhere and beautiful. It's not, he's, it's gone now, it's, he sold it, but it was really nice. 
Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to hear you perform the single from the brand new album later on out on the piano, yeah. so we can't wait yeah. for that. It's called Talk About You, um, and Mickey's album, No Place in Heaven, is out now. Yeah, and we will talk about you more because you're going to be with us for the next 40 minutes, oh, which is cool. lovely. Anyway, so let, I tell you, also we've got in with us tonight Charlie the Chameleon, who uh, we understand likes a bit of a boogie. He's um, He looks, he's sort of doing that thing, you know, when you sit on the stills at the side of the disco at the moment. He's yeah. not looking that, that, uh, that interested, but who knows? Who knows, maybe he'll spring into action very shortly. Um, now, many people like a cup of coffee. Uh, Mika, what would you order normally on the coffee front? Uh, uh, flat white. Flat white. Nice. Michelle? Espresso double. Oh, oh cool. punchy. Oh, yeah. punchy. Oh, chefs, oh, double espresso. Yeah. Always. Matt? You know what I get. You order them, you get them from here every day. <laughs> <laughs> latte. latte. I never know whether to say latte or latte, but anyway. We can say latte, don't yeah. we? A cup of I'd tea say, if you're yeah, interested. Yeah, I'd say cup of tea, I would. But yeah. anyway. It is estimated that in the next three years, there's going to be another 4,000 coffee shops opening up in the UK, totalling 21,000. Which means a lot more coffee waste like this. Now then, you know these things? Mm. Like that. But what on earth can this be used for, then, Matthew? Go There's on. a lot of stuff behind this sofa tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what. Uh, these. There Ooh. you are, Michelle. Oyster Beautiful. mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms. Mm. And here's how. We may be a nation of tea drinkers, but we've learned to love our coffee. Down in more than 70 million cups a day. But less than 1% of the coffee plant actually makes it into our drinks. Now, I can't stand waste, and usually the coffee grounds from our espressos and our cappuccinos go into landfill. But here in Exeter, they're recycling them and using them to grow something really special. Mushrooms. Eric Jung is one of the people who came up with the idea. He's off on his daily collection of Exeter's waste coffee grounds. Mushrooms normally are grown on an enormous industrial scale and uh, typically use stuff like straw. It's important for the straw to be um, pasteurised, so what they do is they heat treat it. It's really energy intensive. What are the benefits of growing on coffee? The beauty of the coffee is it's sterile because of the brewing process, so the water that goes through it kills off everything that's on there. Where do you get all your coffee from? Well, we're lucky here in the heart of Exeter. We've got a farm and um, we pick up from local cafes. So every day we go around with this bike trailer. And every week we collect about sort of 500 to 700 kilograms, which is up to about 70,000 cups of coffee. You're collecting locally, you're yeah. growing locally, and then you're selling the mushrooms locally. Yeah, absolutely. There's like 0 0.01 of a food mile, I'd right. say. Brilliant. I thought we'd only be collecting from small, independent coffee shops. But the high street chains are keen to give us their leftovers too. First of all, they get rid of our waste, so it saves us a little bit of money. Uh, secondly, it's recycling, which is obviously great for us to do as a business. And thirdly, it's really good to support other local businesses around here. Time to visit the farm. But this is no ordinary farm. Two months ago, this was an empty set of offices just off Exeter High Street. Today, it's where Eric's colleague Adam is producing the latest batch of oyster mushrooms. Adam, how you doing? You all right? Oh, yeah. All right. Got the coffee. Fantastic. What do we do with that now, then? So we're in the mixing room where the whole process starts, and the first step, really, is just to get the coffee into the, the mixing machine. Right. Next to go in is a small amount of sterilised straw, some horticultural lime to get the right pH balance, and finally, the mushroom spawn. Once mixed, that goes straight into bags, which are taken to be hung in the growing room. Well, it's dark in here. So this is the incubation room, and you can feel it's quite warm, and normally it's dark. Um, and it's a little bit like being under the soil in the summer. And it's where the mushroom spawn eats its way across the coffee, uses it as food. Um, it's in here for about four weeks or so, and it turns increasingly more white in that time. Do any mushrooms grow in coffee? It's only the oysters that grow on coffee. They're the ones that are most happiest growing like this. After that, it's on to the final stage. So this is the fruiting room, and it's wow. where all the magic happens. You can feel when you walk in, it's kind of damp, lots of fresh air. It's a bit like autumn, and it's a signal to the mushrooms to start growing. So how long do they spend in here? So these ones have come in, and about seven days later, they're, they're ready to harvest almost. They'll produce another crop, so in total, it's about four weeks that they're in it. Right. How many bags do you produce a day, then? We produce ten bags a day like this, and if you think each one of these bags has got around about 1,000 cups of coffee waste in it. Ten bags a day makes for 70 kilos of mushrooms a week, which are sold to local restaurants and shops here in Exeter. And so do they taste of coffee? 
No, they just use the coffee as their food. It's just like as if they grew off of wood. Last stop of the day is a coffee shop kitchen where I can cook the boys a treat. I really want to get the true taste of these mushrooms, so I'm just adding a bit of salt and pepper. Served on toast, I've got to say, these taste great. Even better washed down with a milky latte. Where do you see the business going from here? Well, we'd like more people to grow these mushrooms at home, which is something we'll um, enable. And we also picture a world in five years from now where just loads of these mushroom farms are popping up everywhere. We've already trained sort of 300 odd people from 15 different countries around the world. So here's to coffee and mushrooms. Cheers. Ah, oh, thanks, Ricky. How mushrooms and toast. How did you leave? So, how did you leave some of that? That was unbelievable. I know. What do you do with the waste then from the coffee in your restaurants, Mr. Um, well. Some of the waste, not all of it, unfortunately, but some of, some of it does get recycled. Um, and, I, I, you know, my mum and dad have always had a garden and they've always put it on the garden, uh, especially for, um, for fruit and vegetable patch. And my mother-in-law still swears by it and she says it keeps the slugs away. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I've always seen it done and I think it's a great right. idea. They're lovely, these ones, mine, aren't they? They are yeah, absolutely yeah. beautiful. And on that kind of foodie, aromatic theme, mm. make it. Is yeah. this right that you you collect smells? <laughs> it is. It is. How, how do you collect a smell? It I mean, sounds so bizarre, but uh, just go, go on. on. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> well, I I started collecting like mm. you know little bits of oils and things like that, and then if, for example, you know when you smell a bit of plastic and it has that mm. type of, I would put it into a little flask and put it into the cupboard, and Whoa. then I just did collected. How? You just. So you, you just get these, there's these little brown things, brown glass bottles, right. and you open them up. And if you put something in there and, and mm. keep it oh, in I the see. dark, as you know, yeah. it'll keep its smell. Mm -hmm. And you open it up, and it's like little, it's like time travelling. And now I've got a lot of it. And so I you just re smell like stuff all the time. Psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and you can uh, smell all this yeah. stuff from like, you know, but I. But yeah, that's food. That's food memories. You see, it's linked to food memories. And we thought you'd like exactly. that. You know. I do. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I like this. No, no, Mika, yeah. I'm with you on this one. I think you know, keeping memories in a bottle. It's magic. It's, it's exactly fabulous. the idea. So you open these covers, you've got memories everywhere. Love it. And and this for you, Michelle, starts young. You've just started this whole new series, First Class Chef, mm. cooking with children, kind of teach children. Um, we're going to have a little look at um, at a clip of it now um, because it's ten thousand pounds at stake. There's knives, there's frying pans, but you don't hold back. <laughs> Is this what you're stuffing your chicken with? Yeah. It's mascarpone. mascarpone with some parsley. Skinless chicken? Yes. <laughs> the chicken was superb. It was lovely and moist and the cream inside did the job. They knew what they were doing. That whole dish looked nice visually, but it was very simple. It wasn't quite cooked enough. Yeah. Could have done with probably another five minutes in the oven. Yeah. because they take it so seriously and the presentation was absolutely beautiful wasn't it it's, it's amazing i mean they are we're talking about nine ten uh, the oldest one's eleven but uh, you know isn't it marvelous to see these children cooking and being passionate about it i mean they may not end up being chefs you know i mean they, they can change their mind mm -hmm. um but you know it's life skills you know being absolutely. able to cook and of course bringing the family together as well uh, because obviously they've been trained by their parents and mm -hmm. but that's so important eating as a family cooking as a family as well so I'm a big champion of that. And it is, I mean, it's very competitive, this series. Oh. The, and the, the children are in teams, that's kind of how it works. Just give us an idea of what they're... What... Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, they're, they're representing their school, teams of two, uh, and the winner, the ultimate winner, gets a, a £10,000 prize to go towards a food-related project. So it could be getting some new kit for the kitchen at school, yeah. mm -hmm. it could be planting some fruit and vegetables in their school playground, and so all of that, but it must go to a food-related project. So, yeah, they are, you know, they're so competitive for themselves, yeah. but they're also yeah. competitive for the, you know, for the school. And you were known as a bit of a taskmaster, really, on MasterChef. I mean, how is it dealing with children? Because obviously you don't want to shatter their dreams, but you want to give them criticism, you know, of course. Well, when I mean, it's I, needed. I've, I've always been honest, and, uh, you know, and, and I think it's, it's very important, uh, and, and with the children as well. Very, very honest. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't lower our standards. We keep the same standards, we just simplify the food slightly. So, you know, they, they, they may cook an omelette, and I'll be critical if it's overcooked, if it's under-seasoned, right. um, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. But 
It's, it is unbelievable what they managed to do. Do you know, it's interesting on that seasoning kind of topic, because obviously cooking for children is different to cooking for adults, because you don't want to have too much salt. I mean, we were talking to this... Absolutely. Um, who were we talking about? That John Terrell. It was John Terrell. Yeah. 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 came on. So how does, yeah. it, how does it alter with that then, Michelle, and how do you kind of alter your expectations for that? Yes, and, and I mean, that we do try and get, get across the message as well, to, you know, healthy living, and healthy food is not boring. It can yeah. be good fun. Yeah. Uh, so seasoning is very much part of that. And I always say that seasoning is not just about the salt. You know, there's spices that can enhance mm. the flavour, that can, right, yeah. can bring a dish to life, and also a little touch of uh, acidity in the dish, so a squeeze of lemon juice, a little bit of vinegar, will mm. also bring out the flavour. So it's not just about salt. In fact, very often we put too much salt in food. Mm. Mm. And as you said, even if these children don't you know, grow up to become chefs. It's a life skill that's really important. So how would you encourage parents maybe watching tonight to get their kids involved then in cooking? What's the, some basic recipes maybe they can start with? Well, I think, you know, if you take your children out shopping with you and make it fun, get them to choose the lovely bright colours of fruit and vegetables, especially mm. at the moment. I mean, it's summertime, it's, it's wonderful. Mm. You know, there's, mm. a, there's so, many, so much lovely produce out there. Um, but so take them out, get them to choose simple things like a, uh, a pizza, base and you get them to put the toppings on top and they right. can go off piece they can go a little bit crazy so Perfect. what you know make make it sweet and sour or, or sweet and salty for example you know put an yeah, yeah. put a marshmallow on a pizza with some salami does that sound so good maker? You know. does that sound good <laughs> marshmallow on a pizza what, what what are your tastes and what did you grow up with in your house because your parents are from very kind of different yeah, cultural I mean, backgrounds i grew up with a lot of lebanese food i grew up a little bit in france as well so there's always french food italian food but it was always quite healthy um, marshmallow on a pizza, I've got to tell you, sounds absolutely awful, but still. Oh, come on, boy. <laughs> I, do a, I do a very a good sweet A small as margarita. Right, right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a margarita. Um, but your daughter Emily as well is part of the series, isn't she? So explain then how she comes into the proceedings. That's right, she's uh, judging the final with me, so it's great to have her back. Uh, it sort of reinforces that legacy and that, you know, father to son or father to daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I learnt off my father as well, so it's, uh, it, it's, it, it sort of wraps it all up and it's really, really a strong final. It's lovely. And, and the kids loved it as well, the, uh, the, uh, the finalists, you know, to see my daughter there. They, they, could, they could relate to that as well. And, yeah. and that's the thing, Mika, because you as well, you keep it very much in the family, don't you? Yeah. Your, your music. Is it right that your sister does some of the work on my the My sister does uh, all the illustrations for me. My mother does, uh, works on the styling. My other sister... You're out, well, this <laughs> outfit that you've got on a sister? Uh, no, in general. <laughs> and then also, um, uh, my other sister, Paloma, she used to work on production. We're a whole team and a lot of it happens in the kitchen so oh, the value, right. <laughs> but the value of food as well you don't have to cook like crazy big meals in order to to have the kitchen as the kind of place that brings everyone together yeah. so i grew up in the kitchen I, all my most important memories my whole life mm. were around the kitchen when we had money when we didn't have money yeah. when we had great meals when we didn't have great meals the kitchen was still the place yeah. where the whole, the everything people congregate isn't it naturally